thought horses were domesticated animals. This is a remnant bunch. This is what the millions looked like that roamed the West. These are incredible creatures, and I find that they fit where we, where we see them out there. I'm not going to live long enough to learn half the things that I would like to know about wild horses. We have a few wild horse herds around the United States. The Pryor Mountain horses have genetic markers in them that are unique to those particular horses, clearly linking them to the old Spanish uh, horse. Then you have other wild horse herds where the link is much, much closer to the Morgan horse or draft horse in them. If you took, let's say, 30 or 40 domestic horses of a variety of breeds and turn them loose and come back in 300 years and see what you have, they all pretty much look the same. Natural selection in a harsh environment really slashes hard and leaves you with what we call a primitive horse that shouldn't be meant in a deleterious way biologically. They're fit. They're much more fit for their environment than the horse that they evolved from over those 300 years. And we seem to always get to the same place. A small, tough horse that has some unique characteristics immunologically, nutritionally. Uh, I find going out and watching these wild horses to be every bit as interesting, more interesting. Uh, from a behavioral standpoint, you start to name them. Bison, elk, deer, antelope, go ahead, name it. You can't find anything out there with as complex a social organization and social structure as the wild horse. So you have both a social, behavioral, and even physiological change as we domesticate these, these animals. And that may be part of the reason some people don't like to look at the wild horse as a wildlife species, because they keep seeing a domestic horse. To a lot of people, there is not nah, horse is a horse. But you have to have a sense of history to appreciate something like that. I like to take sort of the long view of history, that long durée view, and to me, horses are actually native species to North America. That's an unpopular view in a lot of circles. I've had people tell me that, you know, horses are nothing more than uh, just like uh, turning cows loose in a pasture. That's all they are, they're just another exotic. Horses originated here in North America and then later went to other continents. And that starts about 55 million years ago. So we have a long history of horse evolution here in North America. And then about 3.7 million years ago, the great diversity of horses that we had here in North America declined down to three. But one of the three horses included this skeleton right here, which is the earliest representative of Equus, which is the group that all modern horses belong to. At some point in their evolution, they, um, they appear to have disappeared from North America. And prior to that, some of them migrated to Eurasia, um, presumably over the Bering Land Bridge. Um, meanwhile, what happened to the American stock, or the North American stock, um, is pretty much a mystery. The, the big question is this business of what happened to the horses. The fossil record tells us uh, that around uh, 11,000 years ago, they disappeared. Along with them disappear our native camels, mammoths, mastodons, ground sloths, saber cats, dire wolves, and another 20 uh, kinds of large animals that I won't have time to mention. What happens around 11,000 years ago? The climate is changing. And for the first time, people are coming into the new world in large numbers. The most widely accepted theory uh, is that the only apocal event 
that uh, coincided with the disappearance of the horse was the arrival of man on the continent. And just as with the mammoth, the theory is that they were simply hunted to extinction in a relatively short period of time. It's hard to imagine if you just consider a human overkill hypothesis that people might have extinguished these large herds of horses that were quite widely dispersed. It's, it's hard to imagine this, at least it is for me. The surroundings, the grasslands, were still a great environment for horse survival. This is one reason I find it difficult to believe that all the horses of this vintage died out around 10,000 years ago, as the received knowledge says. Yes, it is possible that uh, some horses, I suppose, survived the so-called extinction. They would have probably survived in little pockets, and then with the arrival of the reintroduced horse, in very short order, been diluted genetically. Very possible with horses. But I don't make that argument simply because you shouldn't go around and make arguments like that unless you have something to back them up with. Um, I have something to back me up with when I say Equus caballus was here 1.7 million years ago. It originated in North America and it co-evolved with its habitat here. And it was the same species that was brought back by man, a reintroduced wildlife species. And uh, I've always thought that when they returned, they really had come home. With the reintroduction of wild horses, do we treat them as an exotic species, or have we merely returned a, a native to its homeland? The wild horses come from the Cabalines. They represent a distinct group within modern horses. We're not sure if there were true cabaline horses here in North America. Some people who work on fossil horses think, yeah, they were here. Other uh, people say, no, they weren't. The cabaline horse is an old world form. Certainly, if we say cabaline horses were here and then became extinct, then a reintroduction of a cabaline horse makes a little bit more sense ecologically that probably they're close enough. Wildlife doesn't evolve independent of its habitat. It evolves to what it is because of that habitat. Wildlife shapes the land and the land shapes the wildlife. And, and that is coevolution. A good definition of, of a native species is one that has co-evolved with its habitat. And you wouldn't have to go any further with the horse. It co-evolved with its habitat. Yes, there was a 10,000 year gap, but from the standpoint of evolution of habitat, that didn't make a difference at all. The major argument that's, that's used that the horse is not a native species is that the species that went extinct 10,000 years ago was not the same species that Cortez uh, brought back in 1519. Uh, one could argue breeds, but one can't argue species. The molecular biology evidence shows that the cabaloid horse was here in North America 1.7 million years ago. This is a, a species called Equus scotti. This specimen from Rock Creek in Texas is about a million years old. This basic kind of horse is a cabaloid type. It's not far away from the modern domestic horse. horse originated in North America. It evolved to the cabaloid horse 1.7 million years ago, which means the horse that left us 10,000 years ago was the cabaloid horse, and it was simply returned by the hand of man to its native habitat. So what you have is a bunch of arguments over, over breeds rather than species. But that's convenient for those who would like to keep the exotic label on it. And out of that sort of thing comes policy. Whether or not the policy has any scientific veracity behind it isn't important to a state agency or a government agency. Uh, if they can put the label exotic on it, that means they can manage it in ways that uh, they couldn't manage it if it was a native species.
from a historical point of view, the, the U.S. Grazing Service was merged with the General Land Office in, in 1946 to form the Bureau of Land Management. Previous to that merger, the uh, U.S. Grazing Service had a unspoken policy to actually uh, shoot wild horses on site, and they were considered vermin pests um, to be eliminated. Competition with cattle and sheep, basically. Wild horses on the public lands are driven down to anywhere from 10 to 17,000 by the uh, early 1970s. The Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act has been amended several times, but the basic premise of it has never uh, been altered, and that is to protect wild horses on lands uh, that are managed by the U.S. Forest Service and by the Bureau of Land Management. I think the Bureau of Land Management, before the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act was passed, had pretty free reign on how they managed wild horses. And it was an intrusion on their their ability to manage as they so pleased. And if there were horses that they felt were competing with a rancher's livestock or a rancher felt that horses were competing with their sheep, then they could be removed. So strangely enough, the agency that has been mandated to protect them has historically not protected them, in fact, had the view that they should be eliminated. And uh, I think, unfortunately, that historical view has carried through. I've read a lot of accounts of the capture of wild horses in the, the 1700s and 1800s, and uh, those accounts are, are pretty evocative. The Spaniards, for example, had a whole vocabulary to describe why so many horses died after being herded into pens and, and uh, being captured. They had a term uh, uh, called despacio, which referred to the death of horses from nervous rage over capture. The Mustangers in uh, Texas and New Mexico in the 18th century had a term sentimiento, which referred to horses that died from heartbreak at capture. Those kinds of, of uh, historical accounts make me think of horses as you know, truly wild animals. Over the uh, last 30 years, the BLM has determined where the animals should be managed. And that's what we do today. We manage wild horses and burros in herd management areas. 
To be a wild free roaming horse and burrow, the animal needs to live on or come from one of those herd management areas. It's very important that the range be healthy because there are not only wild horses, but there are cattle, livestock, uh, such as sheep, uh, other animals out there, wildlife. So to have healthy horses, you really need a healthy rangeland. Nevada has about 24 to 25,000 wild horses right now. Uh, this next year they're trying to increase the numbers that they want to remove and I believe it's up to over 6,000. Uh, it's an attempt to remove a larger number of animals to make a difference. The BLM has repeatedly sacrificed the interests of wild horses for livestock interests. In fact, they have bent over backwards to accommodate livestock. And while they are supposed to manage these ranges primarily for horses, as the 1971 Wild Horse and Burrow Act says they are, they still very much manage these areas for cattle. We have a few thousand wild horses on literally millions of acres of public land. And on those same lands, we have millions of cows and sheep. And the BLM will say, we're having some damage. It's from horses. We need to get the horses off. And they will keep the cattle on that range while lowering the number of horses. People tend to think of this as a single issue, and it's not. It's really a multiple use issue. Congress says we're going to have wild horses and burros out there, that they are part of the legacy of our, our Western heritage. But it's not exclusively managed for wild horses and burros. With rare exception, it's managed for all of these different uses. There is a tremendous amount of subsidy going on right now to encourage livestock grazing on public lands. There is a lot of deference, I believe, from authority agencies to livestock permittees who have more influence. A lot less livestock permittees are the smaller ranching families. We're seeing large corporations in there. They control the majority of public land interest when it comes to livestock grazing. There's still the myth in the West that cowboy is king, and unfortunately, that myth is being sustained at the health of our public land. We have uh, one property of BLM land that we have a number of wild horses, and uh, they are uh, uh, quite a problem to the range. They have a tendency to go to the same area and they overgraze tremendously and they absolutely destroy the range. And yet we are out there uh, trying to implement the most sophisticated and modern uh, range management policies relative to uh, livestock grazing. The horse can't even get in the same ballpark with domestic livestock when it comes to destroying range. Now that's not an indictment of all ranchers. Many ranchers manage their range very well. Many don't. If it's competition for grass and it's public lands, well, I'm not sure that the horse is always the culprit there, particularly when the cattle and the sheep outnumber the horses so greatly. Through eons of time in uh, this area, wild horses were part of the, the ecology of the landscape. Horses are a herding animal. Their characteristic is to move into an area, do their thing, whether it's water or, or, or feed, and then move. A little bit inherent like the bison, you know, it used to rumble into an area and water up and, and when they leave it was obvious that they were there and they left their impact, but they uh, would not return to that location for some time. And so that gives your, your resources a chance to recover. Grazing animals, uh, that's how a lot of these rangelands develop over time is through it because of animal impact to our soil surface. As far as damage in the range, uh, any kind of species of animal can damage their resources for a short period of time, but we tend to think in short terms of two or three years. If you look at, at a 30 to 40 year period, I would bet that, that uh, it's a least sustaining level of uh, a resource because back to the herding they'll 
they'll do something to a piece of ground and move on. Sportsmen raise this issue all the time. They say that uh, if you allow wild horses in deer range, pretty soon we're not going to have any deer, so we'll get rid of the horses. But you know, it's one of these gut feelings that they get because it looks as though they should be competing. And, but the studies that I'm aware of indicates that that, in fact, isn't the case. The Colorado State studies and the priors have shown that there's no overlap or not any significant overlap in even diet. The competition between bighorn sheep and horses is not a reality, and the competition between mule deer and horses is not a reality. It's really more of a perception than a fact that they have any, any bearing on, uh, on wildlife populations. If horses were allowed to range freely across the land, as they really should be, they would be able to spread out that impact, and they would certainly move from area to area. The problem is that they are fenced in. They are constrained to particular areas. They have literally constructed hundreds of thousands of miles of fences on our public lands at taxpayer expense to create, for all intents and purposes, nothing more than livestock pastures to control livestock. But not only are they controlling and confining livestock, they're also confining wild horses, and that's impeding the free movement of these animals. What we have done, for the most part, we have forced wild horses into some of the most inhospitable places that you can find, simply because there was desired land use for these other areas. In 1971, when they passed the act, there were many, many areas with wild horses. The BLM has arbitrarily decided whether those ranges should be removed or not, and they have removed many of them. Yeah, there's three up there. The risk isn't that you get down to the last animal. The risk is you get down to a critical threshold whereby the population becomes inbred, and then if you get a very severe environmental event, the whole bunch could go. They're certainly not an endangered species, but uh, they do have some characteristics that they've developed that are, uh, you know, make them a great horse for especially something like uh, endurance riding. Now, minimum bid on any horse is $125. The main method we have of placing excess wild horses and burros is in our Adopt-A-Horse program. And we have uh, well over 170,000 adopters in the United States since this program began. They're rounding up wild horses uh, and putting them in holding facilities sometimes for months and even years at a time because the pipeline that the BOM has is full of horses at times and they can't adopt all the horses out that they've gathered. So, you know, it's not only bad for the taxpayers to be paying all this money for feeding and taking care of horses and holding facilities, waiting for them to eventually be adopted, but it's bad for the animals themselves. They're withering away. Adopt a horse has been a fascinating lesson in biology. As you reduce the densities of ungulates, reproduction becomes more efficient. Animals breed at a younger age. Uh, they breed more often. The survival of the young is greater than it was before. So as we gather these horses and then gather all the young, it's like throwing an on switch for those mares that we turn back onto the range. They are now going to come into estrus and they're going to breed, and they're going to breed successfully. And adopt a horse if it has done nothing else except, except cost the taxpayer an immense amount of money has proven the textbooks right. There is compensatory reproduction. And as you reduce the density, reproduction speeds up. They don't have any desire to live with humans. They don't have any desire to see humans or be fed by humans or cared by humans. They have an interest in maintaining their freedom and maintaining their wild free roaming nature. So I certainly do not think it would be okay to take, I, I don't agree that it's okay to take a wild animal and take away their freedom. Even if we provide the best home on earth for them, that's better than mistreating them, but still it takes away that, the most important thing to that animal, which is their freedom. 
we ask these animals to become domesticated, and in many cases, some never do. It's very difficult to try to keep these animals and to train them and domesticate them. It is not as simple as it appears. Many of these animals end up in sale barns, and the only people who purchase these animals at sale barns are slaughter buyers. One could theoretically adopt a horse from BLM for $125, keep the horse for at least a year before title passes, and then sell that horse for six or $700. And there is a market for um, not only wild horses, but horses being slaughtered for meat, and the, the market is overseas in foreign countries. There's a tremendous horse meat market. Unfortunately, the government does not believe that they have any responsibility or um, authority over these animals after that adoption period because they believe it's perfectly legal for these animals to be sold and they do go for commercial uses. Perhaps maybe our failure with so many of these animals going to slaughter is that we are attempting to domesticate a wild animal. And the adoption pipeline is a direct consequence of the authority agency refusing to manage and protect these horses on the range where they belong. Being in conservation biology, I don't see any biological issues anymore in conservation. They're political or economic or social or cultural. And these poor animals like wolves and bison and horses are just symbols for the different sides to rally around. If you have a natural aversion to something, it's pretty easy to drum up a case uh, whether it's horses or anything else that makes what you have an aversion to look bad and everything else look good. And here we have a case where a, a whole group of animals that, that was very successful in the millions in North America at one time has been castigated and blemished um, for reasons that are basically unfounded. Very hard to bring something back when it's gone. And I think that that would diminish the richness of life that you and me and everybody else has. And I think it applies to everything, not just horses, but everything else that, that we would have the chance to keep and, and th for one reason or another, we obliterate. And they should be venerated by the management agencies, the BLM or whoever, as something more important than an unfortunate accident. If we wrote them off, would we understand that they came from a lineage that not only was native in the New World, but had evolved in the New World for millions of years. North America is their home, their heartland. I firmly do think that wild horses belong in North America. Horses are a wildlife species that ought to be out there on the landscape.